<clears throat> um, hello again, everyone. So this is a, a afternoon session. So, um, well, so I'll be giving some uh, discussion about topological states of ma matter. Um, and I should apologize from those senior people who are who are familiar with the subject. So it's going to be a very basic introduction to the subject. Uh, so I'll be talking about, I will start talking about one dimensional systems exhibiting some non-trivial topological states. Uh, in particular, I'll talk about uh, one of these superconductors, uh, one of the topological superconductors or the so-called Majorana chains. Uh, and then I'll switch to uh, two dimensions, which is more interesting. And I'll talk about uh, the sim perhaps the simplest two-dimensional system exhibiting uh, non-trivial topology. Those are the called so-called churn insulators. And I'll talk about the uh, the first uh, churn insulator that has been uh, studied by Haldane in the 80s. Haldane's uh, uh, 2D model on Honacomb lattice. So this discussion will allow me to also uh, make links to uh, topological insulators, which I, I will very briefly mention in 2D. And uh, in particular, I'll talk about kane melee construction. kane melee model for topological insulators. Um, so all these topics will be covered real quickly. Um, and the last point here, which um, will be directly affected by the discussion of churn insulators is the topological order into D. Uh, so the, my main idea here is, will be to draw similarities and also contrast uh, topologically ordered systems with those that do not exhibit this order, but are still topological, such as topological insulators or churn insulators. Okay, so this is the plan. And I really want this to be uh, informal. So if there are any questions, uh, please just go ahead and interrupt me and ask the questions. So this is supposed to be a tutorial for students, basically. Um, yeah, and I'll be careful to follow. Um, the zoom uh, link as well. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, topological, uh, systems in one dimension. Hello? Uh, the, the topic appeared um, in the beginning, well, I should say the subject has been in the center of uh, discussion starting from late, uh, starting from 70s. Uh, 
And in fact, so most of the things I will be talking about uh, uh, concerning topological order were known in 70s, but the subject, but it's, they were known mostly to high energy physics community. And then the subject resurfaced in uh, condensed matter because such systems uh, became possible to realize in, uh, in labs. And uh, most of the interesting properties of these systems have been studied quite recently. Okay, so um, in one D, the interest is coming mostly from the possibility of engineering uh, Majorana chains that can be used in topological quantum computation. And Microsoft is investing a huge amount of money to make these computers uh, and to realize these systems. So and this is the most uh, motivation for me to uh, briefly cover this topic here. So um, the observation by Kitaev in 2001, which was heavily based on earlier studies um, of uh, many other researchers as well, but, but the nice, nice uh, Hamiltonian that exhibits this topological uh, properties is the following. So consider, a simple one-dimensional chain, a regular lattice of spinless electrons that live on this one-dimensional chain. Okay, so fermions can hop from one side to another side. So that's the hopping parameter P, and we have P-wave pairing. Uh, the pairing is has the P-wave symmetry because these are spinless fermions. Okay, these are spinless fermions and they can, in real space, they can get paired if they reside on the nearest neighboring sites, I and I plus one. And delta is some constant. So it's just explicit pairing term incorporated into the Hamiltonian, it's a quadratic Hamiltonian and fermions have certain chemical potential mu. And I, where N I here is the particle number operator. So this is the second quantized form of the Hamiltonian, simply tight binding chain with pairing. Pair, pairing is, has P wave symmetry. If you do Fourier transformation here, you will get basic uh, operator corresponding to such translation is the momentum of so your order parameter in, uh, in K space will be proportional to the momentum uh, and the chemical potential mu. Okay, so it's, an, uh, and let us for simplicity assume that this phase of the order parameter delta is just a real number. It has no phase because it's, in this discussion is going to be relevant. Okay, uh, so an interesting, Mathematical, so it's a quadratic Hamiltonian. Everybody can solve this straightforwardly, but there's an interesting way of studying this Hamiltonian. Namely, if one rewrites it uh, by introducing some uh, other degrees of freedom, Majorana uh, fermions, gamma I1, gamma I2. And if CI is written in this way, in terms of Majorana permanent on CI dagger is written as gamma I one minus I gamma I two. Uh, then, yes. Uh, this one. Thank you. Is this better? <laughs> yeah. I don't think I can do that, but let me try to put it here, maybe. Yeah, I'll, I'll try. Is, is this better? Okay. Um, then, 
So these uh, new operators, gamma operators, are Majorana fermions because they are anti-commuting. The original uh, real, the original complex fermions uh, anti-commute with each other, and therefore these ones are also anti-commuting. So gamma i one is equal to c i dagger plus c i, and gamma i two is equal to i c i dagger minus c i given in terms of uh, complex fermions, but the interesting property of these gamma fermions is that they are real. If you take gamma and emission conjugate, it is equal to gamma itself. So these are clearly our mission operators. Now, uh, why I have these two additional indices, one and two, it just simplifies the, uh, it, it simplifies the picture a lot. If we just think about this, complex fermion C, uh, CI, CI dagger as a box consisting of two Majorana fermions. So this is electron or fermion, complex fermion. Consisting on two Majorana fermions. This one is called gamma one. This one is gamma two. So these are Majorana fermions. And in terms of this Majorana fermion, the whole Hamiltonian has a very simple form. Namely, if we take this, let's call this Majorana chain, for example, chain Hamiltonian. So the same chain Hamiltonian in the simplified case when the chemical potential is equal to zero, and the hoping parameter T is equal to uh, pairing parameter delta. If the Hamiltonian is especially simple. You can simply check that it is equal to minus I T. And I goes run from one to N minus one gamma i2 gamma i plus one one so it's a bilinear combination of majorana fermions um, indices are important here i runs from one to n minus one and we see that if initially we had a chain of fermions numerated by index i. So this was complex fermion one, complex fermion two, so on, complex fermion n. So complex fermion one consists of two Majorana fermions. One is gamma one one. This one is gamma one two. So complex fermion two essentially is gamma two one. This one is gamma two two and so on. The last one is gamma um, N one and gamma N two. Notice that the sum runs from I two, uh, sorry, from I equal to one to N minus one. So, um, and also when I is equal to one, Gamma one one is not entering into the Hamiltonian. So this is an interesting observation, uh, which suggests that something, all, uh, not all the uh, Majorana fermions are entering into this Hamiltonian in the same way. Uh, to, to understand what's happening, it's convenient to do this transformation once again by introducing some set of new fermionic degrees of freedom, uh, still complex fermions, like real, like electrons, by defining them as follows. So let's fi represent annihilation operator of a complex fermion is going to be gamma i plus one one plus i gamma i two and the creation operator 
is going to be one half gamma i plus one one minus i gamma i two. Essentially what I did by this Yeah, the question is, is it necessary to write the Hamiltonian in terms of Majorana fermions? And whether the open boundary is necessary. The open boundary is important here, and this is the effect of the boundary that I'm going to uh, consider in a little bit. Uh, the boundary conditions are open, and uh, whether it's necessary to write it in terms of Majorana fermions, uh, it simplifies a lot. So what I'm going to like in very simple terms, what I'm going to argue today, the show today was actually known from 60s uh, from the paper by Lieb, Matzis and others who did not switch to Majorana fermions and they missed very beautiful and extremely simple physics here. So essentially what I'm telling you known from 60s, but not in terms of Majorana fermions, which basically boosted the field toward this topological uh, quantum computation and uh, attracted many investments. So physically speaking, it is, uh, the physics can be understood without Majorana fermions, although it's going to be extremely hard and uh, not so useful. So in that sense, Majorana simplify the picture a lot. Uh, so we're switching to this new set of uh, fermionic, uh, Fermion degrees of freedom, which basically is nothing but composing what I'm doing here. I'm composing new set of complex fermions out of these two Majoranas. These two Majoranas binding them together into one fermion. So this is going to be F1, this is going to be F2, and so on. This last one will remain, and the first one will remain unpaired. All the rest are, are getting paired. These two are paired together, these two are paired together, this is paired with the next one, and so on. But the very first Majorana and very last Majorana are not going to get be paired. And let's see what we get. In terms of these new operators, what do we get for the for the Hamiltonian? So the Hamiltonian becomes like extremely nice and simple. It is going to be 2t. I remind you that delta is equal to t here. So that's the uh, case I consider for simplicity, although many things almost everything will remain the same if we start varying uh, mu on t or uh, mu on delta a little bit. So the Hamiltonian is going to be 2t sum with respect to i going from 1 to n minus 1. fi dagger fi. So it's diagonal. Uh, just like a, a term corresponding to the chemical potential for these new fermions. So the energy of creating uh, an electron, an F electron is 2T and that's it. How about this first Majorana and the last Majorana? We, we have these two operators, the very first one and the very last one. And what we can do, we still, out of these two operators, we can uh, cook up one complex fermion. Let's call it Fm, which is one half, gamma n2 plus i gamma one one. Okay, so this is a real fermion, which, which can exist in the uh, Hamiltonian depending on the, on the parity of fermions that we have. So if we introduce a new operator corresponding to the parity of fermions, let's call it an M, which is equal to zero or even parity of fermions,
and one for odd parity. When n is equal to zero, we will not, we are not going to have anything on the boundaries. But when n is equal to one, we are going to have one additional fermion complex fermion, but which is non-local, which is split between this boundary and the other boundary. This is what exactly this math is telling us. You don't have one single fermion somewhere in the like complex fermion somewhere in the chain, but it is split between uh, two ends of the, of the lattice. Okay, so that's... Um, This is um, what has been observed. Well, well, it's just simple analytical derivation. And the idea was uh, to engineer such a system. And there has been uh, numerous proposals put forward how to engineer this type of Hamiltonians in experimental setting. And it's still ongoing. Um, the, 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 the engineering is still ongoing. Um, the, the inter, one of the interesting properties of this chain is that <clears throat> if the parity is odd, you do have these two Majorana fermions localized uh, at the boundaries of the chain. And whatever you do with your system, break symmetries, introduce some uh, moderate, okay, break symmetries, uh, torture the system in a moderate way such that it's not being cut or uh, something extremely drastic happening to it, these two Majoranas will remain there. It's very robust. The effect is very robust. And the robustness of it as effect of this effect is so, so attractive. You don't have to uh, have some special additional conditions to have these Majoranas. They, they will be there as long as you're, you're not doing extremely dr drastic things to your Hamiltonian, to your system. Uh, um, the situation is different for this third class of uh, topological states I, I'm going to mention briefly, where uh, like topological insulators, where symmetry of the system is important. So uh, here, basically all symmetries you have are more or less broken. Uh, we, we, we don't have to worry about preserving some symmetries. In topological insulators, the, system, uh, the, the, the story is somewhat different. You have edge states, but uh, the, those edge states are protected by certain symmetries. And if you are breaking those symmetries, edges are changing. This is an example where you don't have to preserve any symmetries. The, 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 these Majoranas are still there and you can encode the information and you can uh, work with these Majoranas. And um, basically it's, from the point of view of quantum computation, uh, it's very attractive. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, in this example, uh, you took each fermion, okay, and uh, two uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, like that. Is it possible also to make a construction so that there are four uh, uh, As what? Uh, is it possible to break each C into more than two operators? to break each C into more than two operators. Uh, yeah, okay, you're talking about some anionic degrees of freedom, probably. If you are doing, if you are doing linear uh, transformation like this one, all you can get is going to be a, a fermion. Well, Majorana is also a fermion. Uh, if you're, but you can, re, uh, you can rewrite a fermionic degrees of freedom in terms of some, uh, fractionalized excitations, each of them is no longer a fermion. If this is not a linear transformation, if it's some, some other complicated transformation, you can get any statistics you want. You can get some anion degrees of freedom and so on, and try to work with that. But the question is going to be those anions that you are interested in, are you going to uh, stabilize those anions at the edges or somewhere in the bulk of the system or not? So that's a very good uh, point. I'll touch upon that later. Uh, is, 
So, yeah, yeah, I don't have, I mean, I wasn't planning on talking about that in details, but experiment is ongoing. So it's not, a, okay, it's a mathematical trick, just this Hamiltonian itself. But you can realize a very similar Hamiltonian experimentally if you introduce some spin orbit coupling and proximity to the superconductors. Take a wire, okay? So this is the part of the wire, just hopping. Uh, pro put it on a superconductor, proximitize it with the superconductor, will, which will induce pairing of uh, fermions inside the uh, inside the chain, and that can be uh, done with the help of some additional spin orbit couplings. And that Hamiltonian is believed to host such uh, such edge states. Now, experimentally, how to measure this edge state? There are techniques. Uh, it's not very easy to understand whether, okay, it's easy to understand, uh, experimentally see the edge states, but whether these edge states are Majoranas or not, you cannot, like, it's hard to prove it. Unless, uh, to prove it, you have to have at least, I think, four chains like this, and then you will have to braid them together to see that the uh, braiding property of the edge state is indeed like is what you expect from my runners, not from just simple electrons. Because I can say, okay, yeah, you have a fermionic degree of freedom at the boundary, but how I know it's my runner, not a complex fermion. So you will have to grade them and study their properties, like many body properties. A wave function made out of, let's say, four my runner fermions. If you start studying this experimentally, yeah, these experiments are ongoing. Charlie Kane in Copenhagen is doing, he's one of the leaders in the field doing that experiment. And as I said, Microsoft is investing a lot into this business. Uh, so it's ongoing. But very strictly speaking, it seems like it's still uh, not theoretically, but experimentally still being debated how to observe my run. Okay. Yeah, at Delft also. Yeah, there are experimental uh, efforts to, to realize this Maranas also at Delft in Netherlands. Yes? Yeah, yeah. it's fine tuned uh, now. Uh, okay, yeah, as long as mu is smaller than 2p, I believe, I am, don't take it. For granted, but I think if as long as mu is smaller than 2p, the, the physics is the same. The only thing is that if these two Majoranas are exactly localized at the very last and very first sites, if you go away from this zero uh, delta equal to p point, you still have a localized um, degrees of freedom, Majorana degrees of freedom at the boundaries, but the wave function is going to be exponentially decaying. Here is just like a delta function is one here, zero otherwise. Then in that case, you will have some exponential decay tails. Okay, so this is one area where topology, um, okay, the, 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 this is one, one interesting field which with promising applications, with ongoing experimental efforts in the United States and Europe and elsewhere and China. Um, but this is one dimensional. From theoretical point of view, a lot is clear already, already at this level. So what else, what are the uh, other interesting effects one can observe? And as was mentioned, for example, how to observe uh, degrees of freedom localized somewhere in the system or on the boundary of the system that are different from electrons or Majorana fermions. So those are not fermions, but have some more exotic properties like anionic ones. How to get anions? To get anions in 1D is hard, but in 2D you can do that. And um, this is what I'm going to talk about. So let me switch to the second part and talk about churn insulators. Yeah, I hope uh, everyone here is familiar with graphene because I, uh, the type of churn insulator I would like to discuss is the classical one suggested by and studied by Haldane. It's defined on the honeycomb lattice. Well, 
right? So it's a fragment on a, of a honeycomb lattice here. A uh, honeycomb lattice um, has a humid cell which has two sides in it. Okay, you can take, for example, this dotted area, dashed area as a unit cell of the honeycomb lattice. Repeat it and you will cover the whole lattice again. So this unit cell has two sides. Let's call it site A and site B. Um, and because of this structure, let me draw it again. So this is the unit cell with two sides. A and B, and I can introduce uh, lattice vectors. Uh, let's call this one, let's say E1, E2, and E3. Every, everything in this lattice can be uh, all, all coordinates of each other side can be uh, found using this lattice vector C1, E2, and E3. Their sum is equal to zero, they are not independent. Uh, so those are the vectors connecting nearest neighboring sites. You can also uh, talk about, let's say, uh, vectors mu1, this one, mu2, which is 3, 2. So this is mu2 and mu3. This one connecting next nearest neighboring sites, uh, mu1 can be chosen to be minus E3 plus E1. E2 is minus E2 plus E3. Mu3 is minus E1 plus E2. So these vectors, uh, allow us to write down the Hamiltonian of the of graphene of electron, let's say living in a honeycomb lattice. So the nearest neighbor tight binding, binding Hamiltonian, which is minus T times sum over lattice sites, nearest neighboring sites, IJ, CI dagger CJ. So this is the tight binding model describing uh, uh, particles hopping between nearest neighboring sites, I and J. Uh, so you can write this down as minus t times sum over r. r is the radius vector, let's say, describing position of the site. Sum with respect to alpha, run, acquiring three uh, values, one, two, three, which correspond to the indices of this three vectors, C1, E2, and T3. So this is going to be CRI corresponding to sublattice A dagger, CRI plus E alpha corresponding to sublattice V plus emission conjugate, okay? So this is one way of writing the hopping between nearest neighboring sites. Uh, nearest neighboring sites uh, belong to different sublattices A and B. So I have two sets of operators. One corresponds to sublattice A, one corresponding to sublattice B. And then this is the Hamiltonian with nearest neighboring cups. <coughs> if you diagonalize, uh, if you, you can diagonalize this Hamiltonian, obviously, uh, by Fourier transforming it. Uh, so I'm not going to write Fourier transformation. I'll just write the form of the Hamiltonian in Fourier representation. Uh, it's going to be minus T times sum over discrete momenta. Uh, so it's convenient to write it in a matrix form. So I'm introducing a, a spinner because of these two sublattices. Uh, I can introduce 
uh, of a spinner, CK A dagger, CK B dagger, the creation operator corresponding to different uh, sublattices are combined into one spinner here. Then the Hamiltonian is two by two matrix. Minus pi k1 uh, k e1 plus exponent minus i k e2 plus exponent minus i k e3 zero and the same thing with uh, emission conjugation Right, so this is the matrix times the annihilation operator corresponding to sublattice A and annihilation operator corresponding to sublattice B. So that's the Hamiltonian after Fourier transformation. And let's call this this part here HK, which is the uh, two by two matrix. All right, so diagonalization is straightforward. All we need is to diagonalize this one, and the eigenvalues of HK can be found uh, straightforwardly. So, epsilon. So, it's a two by two matrix. We have two eigen energies, two eigenvalues. If you do it exactly, you will get plus minus mod T. T is the hopping parameter here. Two cosine. Root three k x a a here is the lattice constant here, distant between between nearest neighboring sites. Plus, I'm continuing from here. Four root three over two k x a cosine over two k y a. All right, so that's not extremely informative, but uh, what this uh, eigen energies have in common is that uh, there are certain values of the momentum k where the gap is closing between two energy branches. And in the vicinity of these two points, the dispersion is linear. So these are the points, so-called k and k prime points which are uh, defined as, for example, uh, as plus minus four pi over three in the brilliant zone. Uh, so these are the, these are the points. Um, and if you calculate the dispersion nearby, It's capital K here. So if you go away from this um, single point where the gap is closing by amount of delta K, uh, you will see that the dispersion is linear. Okay, so the leading term is linear here in delta k. So basically, if you look at the dispersion, it looks like this along k k prime line. So it is k, this is k prime. And along this line, you have this two Dirac points. And in the middle of the Boolean zone in gamma point, the dispersion is quadratic. Okay, so this is uh, graphene stuff, which is interesting. But uh, to get some non-trivial, non uh, let's say, uh, edge mode, they don't exist in graphene, okay? Um, one can do the following thing. Let us take uh, not only hops between nearest neighboring sites, but also let us include next nearest neighboring hops. 
hubs between next nearest neighboring sites like that. And also in the presence of, uh, so we do that in the presence of some flux field. So let's suppose that when particle hops between two nearest neighboring sites, uh, its wave function acquires some phase uh, exponent i phi, let's call it h uh, phi h. Uh, so, so the hopping parameter here is complex. When particle hops from here to here, the hopping parameter is complex with the phase exponent i phi h. So that Hamiltonian can be written down as graphene Hamiltonian, uh, like we, uh, as we described here, h graphene plus next nearest neighboring, let's call it next nearest neighboring uh, uh, terms in the presence of this complex phase phi H. That model is already uh, very interesting. It has uh, very interesting properties. Uh, so hopefully this is clear. I, it will be, it will help me to avoid writing huge formulas, but the idea is this. So let's take uh, next nearest neighboring sites, connect them with each other. And in front of the hopping parameter, we put exponent i phi h uh, and make the whole Hamiltonian Hermitian. In that case, um, so the Hamiltonian, we can do still um, Fourier transformation analogous to what we did here. And let me write down uh, the term corresponding to this two by two matrix in the presence of the uh, complex field phi. So what this phi means is essentially it, it's a, it's a magne it's a magnetic field. You can think of it as a magnetic field that that is threading this one hundred twenty degree triangles everywhere. Uh, let's say. Uh, if these two sites belong to the same sublattice A, the magnetic field is, let's say, suppose it's perpendicular to the blackboard pointing inside. If these two sites belong to sublattice B, there is similar uh, magnetic field pointing outside of the blackboard. That's what this one has plus sign going in, this one has minus sign going out. So that the overall magnetic field threading the, uh, the unit cell of the honeycomb lattice is zero. But within the unit cell itself, there is a modulating magnetic field. So that's the Hamiltonian uh, corresponding to the so-called Haldane's churn insulator. So in, in this two by two representation, that Hamiltonian will look like this in the momentum space. So it next nearest neighboring hops are represented by P prime along the hops along these lines are t prime times exponent phi h. Okay, t prime is real. Then uh, the two by two matrix is minus t prime. Okay, so it's still a two by two matrix, which we can uh, write in terms of Pauli matrices. So uh, it's, it has this form. Let's write it as H0K times identity method. So this is diagonal. H0K is some function of K I will specify in a moment. Minus T times H of K, HX of K times Pauli X component, uh, sigma X Pauli matrix. Minus T times HY of K times Pauli matrix Y, the second Pauli matrix minus d prime times some function hz of k times sigma z. So we see that the, uh, it's a two by two matrix in the momentum space representation, which can be written as a dot product of some vector with components h0, hx, hy, and hz with the power of the matrices. So h0 itself, has some form, 
So let me write it down. It's twice cosine phi h. Phi h is the phase that we introduced, the complex phase. Cosine k mu, k mu one plus cosine k mu two plus cosine k mu three. Um, so there is also hx, hy, and hz. So I don't want to specify all of those. Uh, uh, it's written in Haldane's paper of uh, AD, uh, AD uh, 4, I believe. Uh, what is important about, what is interesting about this Hamiltonian uh, is that it has several phases in it. Um, So first of all, uh, if we were to introduce next nearest neighboring hops in graphene, we do that without this complex phase phi, right? Phi is equal to zero in graphene. <clears throat> and the simple way of writing the Hamiltonian in the uh, graphene Hamiltonian in the presence of next nearest neighboring hops. We can write it as t times the two by two matrix I just erased corresponding to graphene in k space plus p prime, which is next nearest neighboring hop uh, hopping parameters times tk squared, where tk again is a two by two matrix with entry zero. Exponent minus i k e x plus exponent minus i k e y i k e z zero okay so so this two by two matrix corresponds to the hops between nearest neighboring sites. Next nearest neighboring hopping appears in the Hamiltonian as a square of this Hamilton, uh, square of this two by two matrix because all by obviously uh, hop between two next nearest neighboring uh, sites is equivalent to a hop from this side to this side and then from this side to this side. And hence this T plus T square structure of the graphene Hamiltonian. Um, in the presence of the flux uh, phi field, it's not that straightforward because, in principle, um, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, it is still a hold. It still holds, but one has to be a little bit more careful with, by looking into the flux of threading these triangles. When particle goes from here to here, uh, it is equivalent to this hop only if a particle acquires certain phases. So let's say when it hops from here to here with a uh, with the hopping parameter p prime, which has a phase i phi h, that that phase should be also accumulated when it goes to this way around that trajectory. So this is one little subtlety, but which is. Uh, which is uh, which can be taken into account. So I'll skip that technical part and uh, just write down the phase of the uh, uh, um, phase diagram of the Haldane's model. So okay, so. a bit late in time. So let me just um, specifically uh, say what, what, what is interesting about this model here. So first of all, this model has this HZ term, which corresponds to the mass of the Hamiltonian, 
right? Hz is always giving you the spectrum, which is uh, massive. Um, but depending on the depending on on the uh, whether you have the space here or not, this Hz term can uh, uh, can have different signs basically corresponding to k point of the Boolean zone and k prime point of the Boolean zone, which means that the mass uh, in the vicinity of k point here, so Hz term opens up a gap, both in k point and k prime point, but uh, in the presence of the phi, phi field here, uh, the function Hz has different signs. So let I, I should have written down the expression for the, uh, yeah, let me write down the expression for Hz, which is the most important function here. So Hz minus t, t prime times Hz of, let's say, Q is equal to minus three square root three t prime sine of phi a and three square root three t prime sine of phi h uh, when q is equal to k point and when q is equal to k prime point. So we see that the uh, difference in masses of, of the spectrum corresponding to k and k prime points of the blue lens zone. So this difference is essential. And uh, in the presence of that phi field, it uh, ensures that there are uh, there's some interesting topology and some, uh, some interesting uh, H states appearing in the uh, propagating along the edges of the sample. It's two-dimensional sample. So uh, one can complicate this Hamiltonian a little bit more by adding to the Hamiltonian, original Hamiltonian that we discussed, a uh, staggered chemical potential. Let us assume that uh, we're adding a chemical potential to sublattice A, okay? Uh, and a different chemical potential to sublattice B. Okay? So there is difference between chemical potentials uh, corresponding to sublattice A and sublattice B. And this difference, let's call it uh, M, so delta mu A, chemical potential corresponding to sublattice A minus mu B is equal to M. So this is the staggered potential that one can introduce. Then uh, this, Uh, so th this, in the presence of this staggered chemical potential, this function Hz will change just a little bit. You will add M to both terms here. Uh, so this one becomes in the vicinity of Q point, it's M minus, square, uh, minus this expression here, it's M plus this expression. Otherwise it's the same. Uh, so having that, one can draw a phase diagram. Uh, separating two different phases. So one phase when is when both masses have the same sign, okay? You can have such a situation is M, if M is sufficiently large, can the both masses can be positive. This one and this one can be positive. Uh, that's, in that case, the, the um, excitation spectrum of the model is pre pretty much the same as uh, the one in the absence of the phi field. So you have two masses, one is bigger, another one is smaller, but the, both are positive. So this is the so-called uh, topologically trivial phase. That's the outside of this uh, region here. This region here is when both masses have different signs. For example, if you set m equal to zero, they are clearly, so this is, this arrow represents m, this arrow here represents phi h. When m is 
let's say if m is zero, you always have different signs of both mass terms. So therefore, um, the phases along this line is in this topologically non-trivial region, uh, characterized by the so-called churn uh, invariant, which can be written as one out times sine of Hz of K minus sine of Hz at K prime. Okay. Um, so this invariant tells you whether C is equal to zero or one, uh, you will immediately, just by looking at C, you can immediately conclude whether these two gaps have a different signs or the same sign. If C equal to zero, they both have the same sign. If the C, if C is equal to one or minus one, uh, they have different signs. And in that case, you have different phase, basically, the topologically different phase, uh, which is inside this uh, uh, bulk. So these lines here basically are the lines when m minus three root three t prime sine is equal to zero, uh, basically when the or or this is equal to zero. So in this region, c is equal to one. In this region, c is equal to minus one. Uh, and these two and these phases. These topological phases are uh, is very different from the phase outside of this region. Uh, the phase inside the region has a, an edge state. You can study the uh, spectrum again and, and uh, see that there is an edge state. So the qualitative uh, description of this edge state can be as follows. Uh, if you look at the gap spectrum, suppose you, you, you have a, a finite gap. And let us look at the vicinity of the K point only. Forgetting about K prime point, let's concentrate uh, in the vicinity of K point. And let's study the dispersion in the vicinity of this K point. If plus minus square root, K squared plus some mass term, M squared. And M is on this expression, the total mass of the system in the vicinity of the K point. Okay, so this is the dispersion. Uh, can we, okay, it has a gap, but is there a way I can close it? Obviously no, because if uh, M is finite, K, prime, K squared is positive, so there's no way to close it. But what if, what if this K, it's a two-dimensional vector, right? So it's KX squared plus KY squared. What if I assume that, let's say, this is my boundary along Y axis, um, what if I assume that let's say kx is imaginary? Uh, then it will be minus uh, i kappa. So it, it, it becomes if kx is i kappa x, so it will become minus i kappa x squared plus ky squared, right? And in that case, uh, ky can be equal to zero and uh, kappa x, sorry, minus kappa x squared can compensate for this gap. And the gap is closing. But obviously, obviously this can happen only if I have a one dimensional dispersion basically. So this one is uh, imaginary and constant. And the wave is propagating along the boundary of the sample basically in y direction only. So this is a free wave in one direction and a exponentially decaying wave in x direction. So that kind of mode can close the gap. Essentially one dimensional mode in a two di uh, nearby the boundary of the two dimensional sample can close the gap. And that is the uh, signature of the edge state. Uh, the point here, uh, the difference between these two phases is the following. Yes, you can always do this trick near a K point and near a K prime point. If you are outside of this region, in this black region, uh, if you do this trick, basically uh, you will get two modes that will cancel out each other and you don't have an, any edge mode. 
That is the case in graphene, gap graphene, uh, graphene in the presence of this target potential and so on. But if you are inside this region, they don't cancel each other, but they actually are propagating along the same direction. That happens because the two masses near K point and K prime point are different. They have different signs. That happens because of that reason. And basically, there is, for, and for that reason, you have a propagating edge mode here. So that's kind of qualitative uh, description of how this uh, boundary mode appears in the Chern insulator. Okay, uh, so this Hamiltonian is an interesting one, has an edge state, um, <clears throat> but it also at the same time, it, this edge state appears because of the presence of this target magnetic field okay, that is threading this 120 degree triangles. Although these two different triangles have different fluxes that if you look at, at the overall flux through the unit cell, it's equal to zero. But within the unit cell, there is a modulated magnetic field that gives rise to this uh, interesting edge physics. And hence the name of the paper by uh, Haldane, um, quantum Hall effect without Landau levels. So there's no Landau levels because there's no overall magnetic field, but there is modulated magnetic field that gives rise to the edge states. Um, so any questions? Uh, yeah, there's a question if I can elaborate more on the dispersion relation of the Hamiltonian. Um, I would prefer not to do this because of the time uh, constraints, but uh, it's very simple. It's, it's written in many textbooks and Haldane's paper as well. I would, I would be happy to uh, forward some um, literature on that uh, at some later point. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Can, can you say it again? The fact that the key is the in the time the Can you speak a bit louder? I, I guess. The fact that the T and the T the uh -huh. T and T prime are entering into here and here, and then what? And, and you also have the you also introduce them in the graphene model in the very beginning. Right. In the graphene model, it's it enters uh, a little okay. This structure is the same, right? All of, uh, the difference only comes uh, about because of this uh, function H z of k. In graphene, H z of k is such that uh, the gap near k point and the, the gap near k prime point, if you introduce, let's say, for example, this staggered potential m, they are the same. Both are positive, both are equal to m. So that's the situation in graphene. But if you're adding this uh, complex phase of this magnetic staggered magnetic field, uh, you are generating minus here and plus here. And the overall sign of this term, so which is the gap near K point, and this term, which is the gap near K prime point, they both can have different signs. And all the, the game is about the sign of this uh, mass term here, basically. If the gaps have different signs. You are living in this day dashed region. There, the churn number is one, and you do have this uh, boundary edge modes because of this physics here. And if you're outside of this dashed region, then uh, no edge modes. The physics is precisely like in gap graphene. Yes. And then because uh, the negative mass has the electron and hole band so Yes. Yes. That's exactly. So the negative mass cannot have it. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's a good interpretation, but uh, but one has to be uh, 
uh, careful with symmetry transformation then you will have to redefine your some symmetry transformations if you do that um, qualitatively yes but but then you will have to redefine some symmetry transformations okay all right so i have about uh, yeah I have some time left half an hour uh that in that case let me my aim is to get to topological order so i'll very quickly say what happens if you for example take two copies of this haldane's model so one if you have one haldane's model uh here let me draw the unit cell of the honeycomb lattice once again so these are next nearest neighboring cups these are nearest neighboring cups okay so this is a lattice a this side belongs to sub lattice b and this is the uh so let's say you have phi h here phi h threading this triangle and phi h threading this one and if you choose a unit so like this where this is sub lattice a and this belongs to sub lattice b then these triangles are threaded by minus phi h minus phi h this one and minus phi h this one okay the rest is the same so the the total total flux through uh the unit cell that let's say through the hexagon is equal to zero all right but if you have one copy one haldane's chain uh, how lens model then the time reversal symmetry is broken because of the magnetic field because if you're reversing the field uh it's precisely like changing this minus to plus and this plus to minus now the gaps flipping the signs and uh, one situation is time reversal opposite of the other situation okay like flipping the magnet direction of the magnetic field is equivalent to doing time reversal symmetry transformation so one single uh, 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 copy of Haldane's model is breaking time reversal symmetry. But if you are taking two Haldane models, Haldane's models, for example, one with field B in it, uh, let's say one copy of a Haldane's model where copy number one where if you take this 120 degree triangle uh, between sides A, B, A, you have phi H threading it. And uh, copy number two, if you take the same triangle, A, B, A, you have minus phi H. And put them on top of each other, there will be no time reversal symmetry breaking because this phi and minus phi overall symmetry uh, overall field is going to be equal to zero but in each of these two copies we had a boundary mode propagating boundary modes right so well, let's say here you have for example uh, a mode that propagates um, clockwise here you will have a mode that is opposite to it that will propagate counterclockwise so even though the magnetic field will be absent, will cancel out, you will still have uh, two counter-propagating uh, boundary modes. Both are bosonic, or you can say uh, fermionic, but in 1D bosons or fermions are, are the same, basically. You have one-dimensional propagating bosonic mode um, in two directions, clockwise and counterclockwise. They cannot cancel each other. If let's say uh, electrons living in one the first uh, haldane model have let's say spin up and electrons living in the second haldane model have uh, spins pointing down so this will be uh, kind of like spin mode effect when uh, two counter propagating modes with different spins they both survive and both are there okay uh, and how to engineer such a situation? Kane and Mele proposed an in, in, interesting way of doing that. That um, obviously the Hamiltonian now we had the Hamiltonian which was um, 
a matrix in in the uh, okay. So you have two sub lattice degrees of freedom, two valley degrees of freedom, and now if you also add two spin degrees of freedom, you will have an eight by eight matrix. Now, if you add also spin degrees of freedom to your fermions, uh, and the Hamiltonian can be written down now uh, if the uh, analog of graphene in that situation if you have some spin degrees of freedom this is page number five six <clears throat> will be eight by eight matrix So H zero. So this is analog of nearest neighboring graphene. So the bare one, uh, you can write it as um, velocity. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, if you uh, um, if you write it, uh, expand the Hamiltonian in the vicinity of k and k prime points, your Hamiltonian will have the form of a four by four matrix with sigma x tau z d x plus sigma y okay dy you can write it like that now uh, this additional matrix tau it's a still a Pauli matrix which is acting in the space of kk prime points so this distinguishes between two values two uh, Dirac points k and k prime this is distinguishing between two sub lattices so it's the is this is the um, four by four problem that we kind of dealt with already now if one is adding also a spin degree of freedom. Uh, so there is a way of doing this. We will, to have this physics of two different copies of Aldane model. Aldane's model, we have we will have to ensure that the gap of uh, whatever it is, the gap of the uh, layer one. Let's say the the, the gap corresponding to layer one uh, electrons living in which f spins up. The gap is opposite to the uh, gap of uh, spin down particles living in layer two. So in that case, the mass term should have uh, should be like this. So we have to have sigma z, let's say, for layer uh, for the upper layer, and minus sigma z for the bottom layer. And that can be achieved by writing it sigma z cross um, s. S Z, right? S Z is uh, already a uh, Pauli matrix corresponding to the, the, the uh, spin degrees of freedom. So these are real spins. Okay. So this is just an identity, and the Hamiltonian itself can be written down as gain uh, Melde Hamiltonian is the term that couples these two layers with each other. Uh, that can be written as some sort of spin orbit coupling term, which is basically sigma z cross tau z cross s z term. Okay, so basically, this different mass terms for the uh, from for species with different spins. Uh, in the presence of the uh, valid degrees of freedom this, distinguished with, between each other uh, via this additional uh, tau z Pauli matrix. Okay. Um, so I'll try to skip uh, the rest responding to this. So this model, uh, as I said, it preserves time reversal symmetry. I can write down the uh, transformation that reverses time. Uh, time uh, symmetry, uh, but this is not that important. The important qualitatively one can see that the time reversal is preserved because magnetic fields are opposite to each other. Basically, time reversal would flip these two layers with each other, 
uh, bringing the system to the same system we started with, basically. So time reversal is preserved, but there are two edge states, and these two edge states are uh, giving rise to the spin hole effect, right? So let's say in this, if you have your sample has a boundary, uh, spin up particles will move uh, clockwise, while spin down particles will move, move counterclockwise. They won't cancel each other because these are two different currents. But uh, yeah, you you will have two boundary modes basically in that system. Uh, in this in this uh, KML spin orbit coupled system, uh, what is so it's a very interesting uh, system itself. Uh, one property of this system is the following: if you are breaking the time reversal symmetry, let's say by introducing an additional external magnetic field, uh, then this edge structure will be uh, gone. Depending on the strength of the magnetic field or depending on the details, how you break time reversal symmetry, different things can happen, but definitely one of the modes will be gone or something will happen to it. So you don't have ex exactly this uh, edge structure anymore. So these are interesting uh, time reversal invariant uh, systems like unlike churn insulators, for example, where time reversal symmetry was gone from the beginning, you have to have this magnetic field, the Stagger field. Here you don't have to have it, but uh, the 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 uh, edge modes are fragile. Uh, any weak perturbation, some some um, additional uh, um, magnetic field or breaking it's of so the Oh, sorry about that. Uh, the question from the uh, Zoom uh, is it applicable to coupled ladders or at least two leg ladder? Uh, so, this physics I'm talking about is essentially two dimensional. Uh, the what I discussed about uh, Majorana fermions in the beginning, it, that part is applicable to ladders or multi-leg ladders where you can have very interesting edge states with different statistical properties. Uh, this one, it, you do have to have a clearly two-dimensional situation in order to have this two-dimensional, or at least you have to have a white stripes, let's say, but you cannot regard the white stripe as a ladder, right? You, you, this direction has to be sufficiently large to have two-dimensional physics in it, to, to possess the two-dimensional physics in it. Okay, um, so the last part, uh, which I spent 10 minutes talking about, is about topological order. Now, that, in addition to this interesting states that we discussed already, there are states that do have, uh, let's say, boundary edge modes that are extremely robust to, with respect to any perturbations you can apply from the outside. You can uh, add disorder, you can add a magnetic field, break time reversal symmetry of the Hamiltonian by different uh, means. If the system is topologically ordered and possesses this edge modes, it will possess it uh, no matter what you do it what you do to it. Uh, that type of uh, Hamiltonians, that type, so they, that type of uh, quantum systems is hard to uh, uh, engineer and even study uh, analytically and numerically, but in principle, they exist. So these are states where uh, fractionalized uh, statistics is realized. So basically you, you build a system out of, let's say bosons or fermions or electrons um, interacting with each other with some uh, non-trivial ways, some inter a strongly interacting uh, system of bosons or fermions. But uh, if you cool down the temperature down to zero, let's say, in the ground state, you stabilize low energy excitations that do not have the same statistics that the original constituent particles had. Let's say you build, you start with bosons, uh, put them together, they interact in 2D, 
let's say if you have, for example, everybody knows that if you have spin one half um, uh, XY magnet, uh, XY basically magnet can be mapped onto hardcore bosons. So you have a, a system of bosons basically interacting with each other strongly. And eventually if you at low zero temperature, if you uh, stabilize a ground state, uh, that has statistics different from bosonic one. So your uh, low energy excitations are not bosons, not electrons, but anions. This can be achieved only uh, if you have uh, basically topological order in the system. You cannot uh, change the statistics of your uh, low energy excitations without an emergent gauge field. And the emergence of the gauge field makes uh, these systems are uh, very robust with respect to the external perturbations. So one example of a topologically ordered state is, for example, is if you take this Haldane's churn, churn insulator and put it in and introduce a, a, a fluctuating gauge field to it. In high energy literature, one says gauging a model so basically gauging a model is means that couples this electrons that live on the honeycomb lattice on the Haldane's model and make these electrons to interact with some external uh, fluctuating gauge field. So that, uh, that, 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 that that's in the literature that's called gauging. Uh, that gauging procedure gives uh, very interesting properties. So uh, let me just explain a couple of these properties uh, real quickly. So suppose you have this Haldane's model. Let's start with churn insulator. Start with churn insulator and introduce the fluctuating gauge field to it. So suppose when particle hops from one side to another side, uh, there is A, side number one, side number two. Uh, the hopping parameter between one and two is multiplied also by exponent I A one two. A one two is some phase which is fluctuating. Okay, it's time dependent and also position dependent. Depends on these two endpoints. And it has some internal dynamics, which I'm not going to talk about. So it can be Maxwell-like, like electromagnetic-like. It can be some other uh, type gauge field. So dynamics of the gauge field is, let's uh, put it aside for a moment, but let us assume there is a fluctuating gauge field. So that when particle rotates around a closed loop, all these phases are being multiplied. And in principle, uh, depending on the structure of the ground state, they can stabilize some 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 sort of so-called Wilson loop. So if you're calculating an order parameter, which corresponds to a product of creation and relation operators along a closed loop, calculate that expectation value. It may have a phase in it. And that phase will be the phase that is threading this closed loop basically. Uh, so this type of states, are inherently topologically ordered. And let me just discuss uh, the, that example for, the, uh, for just a uh, short time now. So how to introduce a gauge field into the Haldane's model? Well, on a lattice is simple, right? You write in front of each hopping parameter, this type of um, term and uh, assume that it has, it's dynamical, it has some internal dynamics in it. Uh, okay, we can do that. If you go to the continuum limit representation, it's simply, uh, what was this? This was a Dirac electron with a mass in it, right? So Dirac operator, we all know, it can be written as ID slash means that it's multiplied by sigma matrix in condensed matter or gamma matrix in high energy physics. Um, and the gauging, uh, means this uh, minimal substitution, you're adding this gauge field multiplied by sigma matrix also here and plus the uh, mass term here. Okay, so the mass term, as I said, in the Haldane's model, it, uh, you have different masses uh, corresponding to different uh, Dirac points, uh, but this is your Dirac operator anyways. 
And this is the fluctuating gauge field that you have. Okay, uh, Haldane's model, as you noticed, it is quadratic in fermionic degrees of freedom. So basically, which means that this Dirac operator is multiplied by uh, two fermionic uh, spinners. Uh, and this fermion, fermionic degrees of freedom in, the, in this model can be integrated out easily. As quadratic Hamiltonian, you can always uh, uh, integrate out uh, using uh, Gaussian integration. But what you uh, will get out after the integration is the determinant of this operator, which is not that simple to calculate. This is called the effective model, effective low energy theory, which comes about after integration over uh, fermionic degrees of freedom. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let me just not talking about uh, coefficients at the moment, which are irrelevant. Uh, what we get after integration of our fermionic degrees of freedom is logarithm of uh, determinant of this operator here. Which is some beast one has to uh, deal with it somehow. Um, which has an internal gauge field uh, which is fluctuating, so it's time dependent. It's calculation of determinants which has explicit time dependence on it, it's it's really hard. Um, <clears throat> but possible because you can expand in gauge field. So assume that this flux, the, the the gauge field itself is uh, is weak, right? You can treat this as, a, as a, a as a small parameter and expand this action in terms of uh, uh, powers of A. So then in perturbation theory, this determinant becomes, let me put a coefficient here, and which basically deals with uh, the number of fermionic degrees of freedom living on a lattice. So N in front of it, place logarithm of ID plus N. Okay, so this is the leading term where a gauge field is gone, plus the term linear in the gauge field, and then plus the term that is quadratic in the gauge field. And so on. So this is a standard expression for the expansion of this uh, logarithm of determinant. Uh, so this this term is the term corresponds and this term we already know what it gives us. This is just basically churn insulator uh, with no gauge field at all. This is some tadpole, tadpole diagram which doesn't do much linear in uh, at Green's function basically times the uh, gauge field. Uh, this one is the most important term that defines the effective low energy theory. And this is called uh, nothing but polarization operator, right? We have, uh, one has to calculate the polarization operator and that defines the low energy effective theory. So it's just a convolution of two Green's functions as you see from here. Uh, so what is the polarization operator of electrons in a churn, churn insulator? That is the question. Let's take Haldane's churn insulator and integrate out fermions, calculate polarization bubble. Uh, if we do this, it gives us an interesting expression. Uh, so which I will write down and then stop there. And just talk about applications later. Uh, so polarization operator, uh, let's, let's call it, um, New, new. Now, in K space, in uh, in the presence of the mass m, can be written as epsilon mu mu 
room. So it has two indices, mu and nu, uh, that correspond to different indices here, a mu and a nu. Basically, you can calculate diagonal uh, uh, polarization operator of or off diagonal one. So distinguished between uh, various values of mu and nu. So let's concentrate on the uh, so-called odd term, which is linearly proportional to the momentum. P rho here, times and a function which is odd answer, uh, which is an uh, which defines basically the odd <clears throat> entry uh, in the polarization operator under permutation of mu and nu. If you switch mu and nu or places of mu and nu, this is. Uh, Antisymmetric tensor, which requires minus sign in front of it, the rest is not changing. So, this is the term that uh, is odd under permutation of two indices mu and nu. So, I'll write it as odd here, p squared and m. Uh, so, this p odd term, if you do the calculation, basically calculate the polarization operator in Haldane's model, exact calculation gives you some function of m and p, which is arc sine. Uh, but you can expand it in the limit when p goes to zero, long wavelength uh, limit for small momenta, and it becomes one over four pi m over mod m. So that's the sign of the mass term, epsilon mu mu rho p rho plus terms that are quadratic in the momentum, okay? So terms that are quadratic in the momentum are familiar from E and M. For example, Maxwell terms are quadra quadratic in, they contain uh, bilinear, they are bilinear in uh, derivatives. So Maxwell term is of this type, but the leading term that is linearly proportional to the momentum, it, it's an off diagonal term, uh, the mu has to be different from nu in order this to be not zero. But this off diagonal term has this linearly scaling in momentum uh, term, which is uh, called Chern Simons term. So I'm done with the calculational part. So let me just uh, say a few words about the interpretations and what, what this means basically. Um, we see that in churn insulator, we are generating a term in the polarization operator, which knows about the sign of the mass term uh, multiplied by uh, momentum in the first power. When P, when the momentum is small, P is the dominant term, P squared is subdominant. So what we are generating here after gauging this uh, Haldane's model and integrating our fermions, we are generating this churn simons term first, and then Maxwell term is subleading and higher order terms are subleading. So which means that um, if by some reason one is able to uh, couple churns, churn insulator uh, to a gauge field or a gauge the churn insulator, then the effect of low energy physics is going to be dominated by the churn simons term, which, uh, and this is a subject of uh, a separate discussion, but depending on the coefficient in front of it, uh, which is uh, just right coefficient for churn insulator model, for example, uh, one can stabilize anionic excitations and, and so-called topological order. So the edge states in this churn insulator in the presence of the gauge field will be still there, but those edge states cannot be uh, 
broken and they don't disappear if you do uh, some some drastic things with this model for example introduce some additional terms that breaks that break uh, time reversal symmetry or, or so some of the time reversal is already inherently broken here and basically uh, there's very little one can do in order to get rid of these edge states that are present in the, in, uh, in the gauged uh, churn insulator model so those are topologically ordered states low energy excitations uh, I didn't talk about this but are kind of vortices of the churn simon theory, uh, uh, theory which are anionic depending on the coefficient you can get different anions but those are basically uh, uh, anionic quasi particles not electrons not bosons but some some sort of anions uh, which are very interesting again from the point of view of topological quantum computation or just from purely academical uh, point of view so I think I should start here uh, any questions Yes, please. Uh, when people say that it's over to the expected function, um, can you please elaborate what I mean? For example, if I just say that and the order to this, mm -hmm. it's already begun writing things like disorder to this. If you add disorder to this, okay. So, um, if you're adding disorder, then it becomes a matter of a comparison of different scales, you know. If disorder is, uh, um, let's see. Okay. If if disorder, if the scale corresponding to the disorder is smaller, than the energy scale, let's say, is smaller than the other energy scales in your Hamiltonian, then you are safe. Uh, in topological insulators, the situation is completely different. You add some infinitesimally small time reversal symmetry breaking, for example, that already changes the edge structure, right? Here is no. Uh, of course, if you add uh, like a lot of disorder that just basically um, localizes everything, all your possible excitations, that will change the total ground state. But what I'm talking about is it adding uh, amount of disorder which uh, corresponding energy scale is smaller or comparable to other inherent energy scales in the system is, are not it, that that is not going to change much mm -hmm. sure in the in that uh, can we uh, when we add can compare when we add can we be able to that Mm -hmm. Is it comparable to the system of single fermions, except that the spin somehow adds like the mechanical field? Because I can imagine some kind of antiparamagnetic texture where uh, if um, if there is uh, a point on the A sub lattice, it sees magnetic field only at the B sub lattice, and then it can act as an opposite magnetic field on each other. I'm not sure I caught your question, but if you're asking if you want to get rid of the real spin of electrons you need to introduce some additional don't call it a spin but you will need to uh, distinguish between these two uh Haldane layers what I mean, like, uh, in the in the earlier scenario having the standard magnetic field mm -hmm. uh, can we get the exact same model by some by adding spin or is the model different in two i know if you add a spin it's a different model Okay, in original Haldane's paper, he said that internal uh, magnetic moments in a lattice can give rise to staggered magnetic field. Uh, this is somewhat similar to what you are saying, but in fact, in all materials, you don't have this this type of situation. So it's somewhat. Other questions? Yes, please. So, if I understood, so if you don't have. Uh... But with the magnetic field, it's just a turn insulator, so you get uh, an edge space uh, inside the gap. Or, or yeah. um, then, with uh, with a finite fluctuating field, you get an ionic edge space. I wonder if the coupling to if the charge of these fermions go to zero, actually, at a transition between an ionic edge space to fermionic edge space, right? 
So what, what do you call a charge is basically a coefficient in front of the coupling to the gauge field or or, or something else? But there in the, the real variance, uh, the real variance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, e. Right. E. Yeah. Right. Right. But then if E is equal to one, like in this case, you get anion X states in that. Right. Now, I see, I see, I see. Uh, see, um, if you, yeah, yeah, I, I should have. So let me clarify this a bit. So uh, I constructed the Hamiltonian by postulating some externally fluctuating uh, gauge field, right? But in fact, if you would like to stabilize a system like in nature, like right, find a material that has this property, this gauge field should not be added from the outside. It should be internally generated, so-called emergent. It, it should be an emergent gauge field. So how do you get an emergent gauge field in a system of bosons, for example, right? Start with bosons that interact with each other somehow, like nearest neighboring terms, maybe next nearest neighboring terms. Uh, let's say spin half operators interacting between nearest neighbors and next nearest neighbors, some magnetic exchange model. Uh, how do you get an emergent gauge field there? You don't introduce it from the outside, it should emerge inside. Uh, mathematically, it's simple. You do some non-local transformation, uh, represent your spin operators or bosons via some non-local combination on a lattice of some, uh, can be fermions, for example. You can always represent your uh, spin rising or lowering operator residing on site I as a fermionic operator and exponent I um, E. So now E is a, some new charge. Uh, some argument R I minus R J and J, uh, where N. So this is a, a fermionization procedure. Uh, transcyclic fermionization that allows to represent spins residing on a two-dimensional lattice in terms of uh, complex fermions. C is a fermionic creation annihilation operator. N is a number of fermions residing on site J. And this is just the argument is a, a, a angle function between R i and R j two two radius vectors. So this transformation allows it's a non-local transformation that allows to express, let's say, bosonic operators in terms of fermionic one and some sort of fixed gauge um, uh, phase attached to it. Now, this is already a non-local transformation. You can write it down as an emergent gauge field uh, uh, with some sort of churn, churn Simons uh, dynamics. Okay, so that has a different charge. It's not the charge of the electron, but it's some, some sort of, let's say, a topological invariant or some, some number here <clears throat> that, takes, that, that takes care of the statistics of your uh, particles you want to have in your system. For example, if you want to have an uh, electron here, this has to be equal to one. Uh, the coefficient has to be equal to one. Basically, you can represent your uh, bosonic particle as a fermionic one and uh, some sort of flux attached to it. It's like a flux attachment procedure. Um, if you want to represent, if, if, you have, if you want to start with fermions, you can take a fermionic uh, particle, represent it as yet another fermions, but then you will have to attach two fluxes in order to have the same statistics. Then this number should go to uh, two, should be two. So your effective charge determines the statistics of the particles you want to have in your system. This is mathematically. And that tells you what the coupling to the, the, uh, to the dispolarization operator, hence to the trans term is going to be. So that determines the coupling you want. And uh, this gauge field should be not uh, imposed from the outside, but it's internally generated. So I did not talk much about this, but it has to be an emergent gauge field to, to uh, stabilize anionic excitations. 
yeah, still a wonder. I mean, mathematically, one can add even if it is imposed from outside, but that is a continuous loop. So, so your question is now, yeah, so you have a this one continuously tuning this one, and you want to tune it to zero. Like mathematical perspective. Uh huh. Uh huh. So you are saying, uh, it's some kind of transition from fermionic state to anionic state. Right. Let's say if that charge is tuned to be equal to zero, you don't have any gauge field at all. The gauge field is gone, right? Uh, so these terms are gone. You have uh, the, the channel insulator we started with. Uh, now, um, I see. So at small values, okay, I, it's a good question. Uh, um, it's kind of a little bit artificial because uh, coefficient itself stabilizes the statistics and that type of transition you won't express. Okay, transition in statistics in physics is you cannot expect it, right? Um, you don't have continuously, uh, you don't have quasi particles that continuously change, change their statistics. You have particles characterized by statistics, right? And not a transition where particle changes, changes, changes the statistics uh, uh, like uh, all the time, and then eventually becomes a fermion, for example. You don't have such situations, but mathematically, it's a very interesting question. Yeah, you have such a transition like that, and one can pro possibly study it. Other questions? Okay, uh, there's a question. Can you have a topological order without an emergent gauge field? The answer is no. Uh, one correction is that in some literature, you can see, for example, this one dimensional Majorana chain is referred to as a topological order because uh, see it's uh, still those Majorana H states are very robust. Uh, even if you introduce some additional perturbation to the system, but that is a one dimensional situation, which is very simple, uh, uh, very, very um, special. In 2D, you do have a gauge field. You do, uh, you have to have a gauge field in order to stabilize you do have to have an emergent gauge field in order to have topological order. Okay. So there's question, what happens if the gauge field fluctuation is large? Uh, so uh, again, um, the gauge field fluctuation is determined by terms here and here. So uh, at small momenta, the, 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 the leading term is uh, proportional to the momentum, which is um, the so-called Chern-Simons term. Uh, the subleading one is the uh, Maxwell term. And then you can have uh, other terms as well that are higher, that contain higher derivatives than the Maxwell term has. Uh, so Maxwell has uh, quadratic in derivatives. You can have more. Now the fluctuation large means that the next terms Maxwell or the term which is next to the Maxwell is even stronger. Uh, then you you have to study those um, um, models. For example, if you just take Maxwell term plus chern simons term, it's called maxwell chern simons action, which is by itself is extremely interesting one. In this action, some mysteries are happening, by the way. Uh, take Maxwell term plus chern simons term. Uh, you know, in Maxwell action, you have a photon field, right? Uh, which is massless. The photon propagator is massless. But you're adding chern simons to it. Uh, 
even though the propagator still is gapless, uh, so still is uh, um, diverges, let's say it's zero uh, momentum, but but the photon field is gapped. Uh, it's a gen way of generating a photon gap uh, in Maxwell Chern's famous theory, which is just which is very different from Higgs mechanism. It's a topologically generated mass term, which is very interesting. So fantastic physics is happening in this type of gauge theories, which have up which has applications in condensed matter in in those topologically ordered systems. Yes. Uh, how it comes, uh, how an emergent field comes into the picture. Let's say, for example, you have a boson, right? Uh, as I said, start with a system of bosons, for example. Now, each boson, uh, I'm going to answer your uh, question technically, not, not uh, qualitatively. So technically, each boson you can represent as a as a gauge field coupled to not okay some flux field coupled to fermion. So if you write the theory down in terms of fermions, you already have naturally uh, emergent gauge field there. If by some reason these fermions uh, become low energy excitations in your system, then the gauge field will remain there forever. So that's a way of uh, engineering, uh, generating emergent gauge field. Okay. Other questions? Yes, please. Why don't you generate the PE compounds? Is it because of the wait? P. Why don't you generate PE compounds? Is it because of the small gauge field approximation or because of the no, no, no. It's just because of the topological reasons. You you do generate an even part, not not this one. Uh, you do generate it, but it's uh, it is subleading. It, it is here, like Maxwell like. So I just uh, disregarded it. Small wavelets, absolutely. It's a Maxwell type. So uh, to be honest, I have to take into account Maxwell, Chern Simons, and even other terms. But yeah, for the moment, I just wanted to pay attention to the Chern Simons one. Yes, please. Uh, I heard about the topological order in the context of the Very, very good question. Uh, well, Physics is uh, uh, of, of, uh, of Tori code is very rich, but it is based on topological order with uh, discrete symmetry. So the topo the symmetry group in topological in in uh, Tori code is Z two symmetry. Uh, topological uh, order it's Z two topological order. Here I mostly talked about, you see, a gauge field A, which is a U1 gauge field. So I talked about continuous symmetry and uh, uh, topological order with inherent U1 symmetry. Or uh, you can do SU2 symmetry if you want to.
Uh, you're a co-host now, Dmitry. Hello. Sibran, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's already right. started. I just introduced you. All right. Uh, thank you. I uh, didn't hear that, but I'm sure that you said some very nice words. Uh, can you see my screen? No, no. All right. How about now? Yes, yes, it works. It works. All right. Uh, on my screen, do you also see the Zoom panel? You should don't. This is the other 